Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, here at the hemicycle of the European Parliament, and welcome to you two online. Welcome to the 20th edition of the European Week of Regions and Cities. And yes, do take a seat. This is a festive occasion, the 20th, ce the celebration of the 20th gathering of people involved in local and regional politics, joining forces, exchanging ideas, exchanging best practices, working together in a European context. It all started in 2003 with 10 regions joining forces, but today and in the next couple of days, over 500 local and regional authorities are represented here, as well as nearly 20,000 external partners, senior EU officials, academics and journalists alike. It's grown into the biggest Brussels-based platform for sharing knowledge on cohesion policy. This year's theme is new challenges on Europe's cohesion, with a focus on themes like green transition, digital transition, territorial cohesion, and youth empowerment. And mentioning youth empowerment, there are a lot of young elected politicians here among uh, you. So let's see, where are you? Raise your hand, young elected politicians. Welcome. As I said, it's a festive occasion, but at the same time, of course, at times like these, when a war is raging in Ukraine, when an energy crisis is raging all over Europe, those are topics that need to be addressed and will be addressed. My name is Annelies Beck. I will be your moderator throughout the event this uh, afternoon, and um, I'll be welcoming um, prominent guests in a moment, like Vasco Alves Cordeiro, President of the European Committee of Regions, Elisa Ferreira, Commissioner for Cohesion and Reforms, and Roberta Metzola, President of the European Parliament, our host, so to speak. That's for in a moment. First, let's hear from um, the colleagues who are taking care, managing and moderating comments um, of you watching online um, and on social media. Alejandro, what are you up to today? Thank you, Annelies, and what an amazing opening of the European Week of Regions and Cities in its 20th anniversary. I also want to welcome our online and on-site participants. I'm Alejandro, and I will be your social media host. So please keep interacting with us and use the hashtag EU Regions Week through our social media channels, Facebook and Twitter. And of course, use the live chat of the events platform. That's once again, hashtag EU Regions Week. Now, for anyone who decides to take part in our upcoming coming polls, please visit the website slido.com or the applications on your mobile phone, tablet, or even computer. For Slido, you will require a code, which if it's not appearing right now on the screen, I will give it to you, is EU Regions Week. With that code, you can interact with us on the polls. Now, I will you, this is how it's going to work. I will give you a question right now, possible answers, and in my next intervention, I will give you the final results of that question. Let's give it a try. So, in the first question, how would you define cohesion policy in one sentence? For the options we have, cohesion policy promotes solidarity across Europeans, cohesion policy reduces inequalities in Europe, cohesion policy supports sustainable economic growth, cohesion policy addresses Europe's crisis, and cohesion policy fosters territorial cooperation. Don't, don't forget to interact with us on our social media platforms, Facebook and Twitter, with the hashtag EU Regions Week. For those who are only using Twitter, we will kind of have a, a small poll, let's call it, with a question on which one of these years four topics interest you personally the most. The options will be there on Twitter. And again, for Slido, just go on slido.com, use the application on your mobile, tablet or computer, and I will give you the results in my next intervention. Now, now, let's, let's continue, continue with this incredible opening of the European Week of Regions and Cities. Back, Back to you, Annelise. Annelise. 
Thank, Thank you very much, Alejandro, for that. Inspiring questions indeed, and do engage out there um, with what's happening here in the hemicycle of the European Parliament. I would like to welcome um, the guests on the podium, uh, Vasco Alves Cordero, um, welcome, Elisa Ferreira and Roberta Mezzola. Welcome to all of you. You can applaud them. <laughs> We will hear from them within a um, couple of minutes, but to be very clear about what um, we will be talking about here this afternoon, let's um, look at a clip to state the first big question, which is, what is the state of Europe's cohesion? A number of interesting talking points. Mr. Vasco Alves Cordero, as President of the European Committee of Regions, may I ask you to elaborate on what we just saw and what, according to you, is the importance of a cohesion policy on a European level? Well, thank you so much. And first of all, let me, on behalf of the Committee of the Regions, welcome you all to this uh, opening session of, the, um, of this initiative that. Uh, brings us to the new challenges that cohesion is facing across Europe. I would like also to um, thank our hosts this, uh, this afternoon, uh, President uh, Roberta Mezzola of the European Parliament that welcomes, here, uh, welcomes us here in uh, her house uh, to have this opportunity to have everybody uh, meeting and discussing this issue. Also a special greeting to Commissioner Elisa Ferreira. Uh, our partner in this endeavor of uh, having this European Week of Regions and Cities. Let me try to very briefly... Uh, very briefly, that's my role indeed, to keep you all on a time schedule. I'm sorry, it's not the most popular role, but I appreciate it. <laughs> First, cohesion, cohesion is not something that, uh, putting it another way, cohesion is the very core of the European project. So you're not talking about something that you establish to be achieved. No, it's the very idea of the Europe European Union relates to cohesion in the several aspects. The times we are living are very, very, very challenging concerning this issue. Not only because, as the eighth report on cohesion demonstrates clearly, some of the aspects that can be improved in the way cohesion policy is delivered, but also because the situation we are facing post-pandemic, the war in Ukraine, and today is uh, a very sad and dramatic day that remembers us the impact and what is at stake in war in Ukraine. And I would like to extend our solidarity to the Ukrainian people and tell them they are not alone. We are fighting with them because this is a fight for our common values and common principles. But... To conclude, much has been achieved in cohesion, but there are new challenges. New challenges not only about 
for example, energy or digital, but new challenges about the procedures itself in the way we can deliver a better cohesion policy. And especially to recognize the role that regions and cities across Europe play when we intend to have cohesion. You cannot have cohesion if you don't value and recognize the role of local and regional authorities across Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much. President Cordero already mentioned the eighth cohesion report, uh, Commissioner Ferreira, but um, what is it that uh, you think are the main takeaways from that report? The first, uh, well, first of all, it's really great to see so many people connected to address cohesion as a core, a core issue and a core condition for Europe to function because we are uh, playing with very critical things like a single market, full competition, uh, movement of people, movement of capital. And so if we don't have a kind of a machine that uh, fosters the growth of the weakest, then they will be left behind. And if they are left behind, we cannot be united because we don't share the same opportunities and same wealth. That is my first comment. We, and this is reason why to address these issues, to address these challenges, we have got to have regions, cities engaged. Uh, cohesion policy is a policy that goes bottom up, uh, that requires partnership, that uh, requires vision, and then the use of the instruments. And the Eighth Cohesion Report has shown several, several things. The first one is that, in fact, cohesion works. Because uh, uh, looking at those uh, member states that joined in 2004, they had uh, income per capita 59% uh, in 2019 of the average of the European Union. Uh, in, uh, in 2019, they were about 70, 75. 70, so they have, they have really moved very, very fast. The weakest regions uh, sometimes, uh, for cer certain regions, grow 5% in a couple of, of years. So, challenges. The first one is that some of this fast growth is in itself imbalanced, and some countries are growing very fast, but they are creating internal imbalances. The second challenge is that after this period in which a lot of investment is done uh, in relation to infrastructures, uh, then keeping the pace and keeping going and keeping growing is much more difficult. So often we have regions and countries that after this initial growth, then they stagnate or decline because the demands, the requirement, the recipe to go on growing, it's much more complex, and we have got to look at it. And then you have the big cities that have a very, role, a very important role to play. Also, from a functional perspective, they have got also to assume some responsibility for development of the surrounding areas. If we add, you add to this, all the challenges we are facing with asymmetric impacts, being the globalization, be it the COVID crisis, be it the uh, invasion of Russia, of Ukraine. And again, also I would like to express my solidarity, uh, solidarity with the Ukrainian, uh, our, our friends in Ukraine. But if we think of these challenges and now the inflation and the energy crisis, we have a lot of interference and we have got to be strong and to be intelligent in keeping the dynamics, keeping the cohesion going and not lose the, the vision of where we want to go, although adapting to the different circumstances in our way. And it's very important to see that the European Parliament represented at the highest level, and thank you for being here, President, and the Committee of the Regions uh, is so engaged, and I think we'll do it because we are together. Thank, thank you, you very much, Commissioner Ferreira.
And that brings me to our host, to uh, the President of the European Parliament, indeed, Roberta Metzola. Um, the war in Ukraine has been mentioned a couple of times, the need for solidarity, um, expressions of solidarity as well. Um, I understand that's something you want to address as well in the context of this um, gathering. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, how much time do I have? You have six minutes, and I want to thank the previous speakers for sticking to what their allotted time. That's actually extremely nice. So thank you. Thank <laughs> you very much, and I must say welcome. Uh, welcome to the European Parliament. It is not only a, a pleasure uh, to host you here, but a privilege for me uh, to share a stage uh, with Vasco and Elisa. Uh, the commitment that they have expressed as one that is shared by this whole house and it's really quite an honor to be able to host this 20th um, uh, ed edition of the European uh, Week of uh, Regions and Cities. It has always been hosted by the Parliament and it is something that we missed very much during the pandemic. Um, as you said, um, dear, dear, dear Chair, I, I would like to start by wishing that this was a happier day. This is a very sad day for Europe. This is one uh, that has witnessed the most severe uh, atrocities uh, in Kiev and in so many Ukrainian cities. It is a sad day, but our grief must move to a determination to do more, to stand tall and be more steadfast together with our Ukrainian friends. I have been in contact with them all day uh, as we seek uh, uh, to help people who are looking for shelter, as we seek to identify uh, the ways that we, uh, as a European Parliament, but as Europe, can help uh, Ukraine in fighting against this brutal invasion. Let me be clear that a regime that targets indiscriminately, indiscriminately that uh, rains terror and death down on children is a criminal one, and it is one that we will not stop in fighting against. I would also like, I would also like to thank you uh, all of you for having been essential over the past years. Uh, we just had a good conversation with, with Vasco in preparation for this um, meeting, is that without your help, without your essential role, then we would never have managed to get through the pandemic. Today, we would also not be managing to open our homes and our hearts to the Ukrainian people who are fleeing the most brutal of terrors. Why do I say this? Because there are times when we don't talk about this enough, that Europe is made of what is decided and carried out at the local level, that I, as a member of the European Parliament, I rely on the leaders of the different regions in my country in order for the very decisions that are needed to be taken as close to the citizens as possible. We have heard this a lot, and I'm happy that there are so many young people uh, in, this, uh, in this plenary, in order to reinforce the fact that when we're talking about cohesion policy and how important it is, when we're talking about where our funds go, how we take the decisions for uh, financial uh, infrastructure to be able to trickle down to the lo most local of levels, without you, would not be possible. Without you, it would not be possible to take care of our communities, to make sure that our local businesses are supported, to make sure um, that our farmers are supported, to make sure that our entrepreneurs are there in order to spread the community message and help at the lo most local level. So I'm here to, to reinforce that, to tell you that the European Parliament is by your side, that there is no, for me, distinction between what level of decisions is taken, but to reinforce how important it is that it's taken at the most local uh, of, uh, of Europe. Uh, I came, I entered this room the first time as a representative of a national student union, a youth organization, 
And I remember thinking, my goodness, this is where a lot of things could be done. 20 years later, because it was 20 years ago, long time, mm. I still think, can we do more? Can we communicate better what we say here in our individual towns and villages? My appeal to you would be that at the end of this week, that you do precisely that, that you take away from what you discuss with colleagues from all over, and I can tell you that some of my friends who are today in the European Parliament were with me then 20 years ago, and we look at each other, we say, have we done enough? I don't think we can ever say that we have done enough. Our citizens want more from us. We heard them talk, uh, talk what more we can do during the Conference on the Future of Europe. It is our task to take that forward. The European Parliament and the Committee of the Regions of the European Commission can do so much more in order to get that message across in a true and tangible way. Thank you. I think I was less than six minutes. You were less than six <laughs> minutes. You were very generous. Thank you. Not only impassioned politicians, but also very punctual and um, polite politicians. Thank you for that. Um, Ms. Mazzola, <laughs> you will be leaving us in a moment, but... Um, my extra time, my reserve time. I'm yes, please, because we would like to take this opportunity to make a family photo now that the three of you are here. There are names in the front of the um, podium. So if you would stand there with your back to the public, but, but all of you are in the picture, so put on your brightest smiles, please. <laughs> Um, then we will take this opportunity to take the photograph and then take this um, historic, this festive moment um, for this gathering forward into the discussion. If I may ask, sure. then um, we take a moment for the photograph. No, it's there, right? Over oh, there. Yes. <laughs> This oh, way? we look that way. Oh, okay. Can I just... Wow. Oh. <laughs> I think <Sorry>. they can <laughs> better. never to give my back to people, well, you know? <laughs> you up like that. Thank you very much. You looked all okay, lovely. Thank you. So thank you to President Metzola for being here, taking the time to join us. And Commissioner... In the same place. Same place, please. Forward. Yes, you can... Stay with us, please. So, to get an idea of what it means when we mention European solidarity, here is a short video to kick off the discussion that will follow. So for this uh, second segment, uh, the question of solidarity is asked. Please do take a seat. Um, the next panelists will talk about what that means in practice, what that means in their communities and in their regions. Cohesion policy transforms from principles on paper into practice and action in a unique way like no other EU policy does, in fact. 
And I welcome a new guest on the podium, Apostolos Tsitsikostas. Welcome. You are the first Vice President of the European <laughs> Committee of the Regions. And also a governor, the governor of uh, the central Macedonia region in Greece. Mm -hmm. So please tell us um, what solidarity means where you come from, if I may put it that way, and from your practice. Well, let me first say that it is true that we are facing huge challenges nowadays. And these challenges need to be answered in a concrete way with solidarity from the European Union. Uh, sanitarian crisis and the aftermath, the inflation, the energy costs, the recession that we might be getting into, climate emergency, all are factors that we need to take under consideration. And of course, these crises could change the standard of living for all Europeans. So Europe needs to act now and it, uh, it needs to act on the ground. Any further delays, you know, and this is why I wanted to start with this, or even a failure to address these challenges, risks Europe's cut-off from its citizens. And the citizens then would or could turn eventually to the loud, deceptive voices of populists and extremists. So while we have all this discussion here in Brussels, we, the 240 regions and 90,000 municipalities of Europe are working on the ground to make sure that funds from Europe, basically and more, mostly cohesion funds, will reach every household, every citizen, and at the same time by implementing very important projects on the ground. So in my region, for example, in the region of Central Macedonia in northern Greece, we are renovating hospitals, schools, sports facilities, houses, making them energy efficient. We are financing SMEs to reduce energy costs. We are installing photovoltaic systems and new charging stations for electric vehicles everywhere. We are replacing the vehicle fleet of public institutions, municipalities with electric cars. And we are also replacing uh, the old lamps in our roads with new low consumption LED bulbs all around Central Macedonia. And of course, we are building waste treatment plants to improve living conditions. So this kind of public works and hundreds of more that I could mention today are happening today in every corner of Europe. However, there is a danger, if I may say. Cohesion funds during these last years turned into a critical emergency instrument because of COVID, because of all these crises we have in order to tackle this crisis. We must be very careful, though, because systematically redirecting resources from the cohesion's operation funds and programs will not be a sustainable solution long term. And I really want to urge you all today, and especially Commissioner Ferreira, who is one of the greatest friends of Europe's regions and cities, uh, to defend the original purpose of cohesion policy and to reject any attempts harming the cohesion principle. In other words, and I conclude with this, emergency management should not become the new normal for cohesion policy. This must be clear because a lot of regions are lagging behind. So if we continue this way, having cohesion policy in the center of our policies I am sure that we will be able to get out of this crisis, tackle the problems that we have, and of course, continue on building a strong future for Europe with its regions and cities in a protagonistic role. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tsitsikostas. A very clear message that was. Now, if all goes well, I would like to bring in Carmine Pacente, member of the Milan Municipal Council in Italy. Um, Mr. Pacente, I should say, uh, is joining us online from the City Council in Milan. And before we go to him, I need to inform you that a strike action has been called by the interpreters. Consequently, some of the languages might not be available when remote speakers like Mr. Pacente um, take the floor. But all should be clear. Mr. Pacente, happy to see you there. 
um, in Milan, and I understand you're not alone, that the council is with you, if I'm not mistaken. The floor is yours, Mr. Pacenti. Good afternoon, and it's a pleasure and an honor for me to be here, of course. Uh, thanks uh, to the European Cohesion Policy and its programs, uh, for example, uh, the national operational programs for metropolitan cities here in Italy, or the European Social Fund, the European Regional Development Fund, but also the Urban Innovative Actions and React EU in Milan. In the last programming period, 2014 and 2020, we co-financed projects for around 200 million euros urban mobility, social infrastructures, social services, urban regeneration. But I'd like, in few words, to focus on one example that, in my opinion, is really important. We co-financed also in our town public showers for homeless people in different public spaces of our urban areas with a budget of around 3 million euros more or less uh, half from the National Operational Program for Metropolitan Cities, and on the other end, half from react -U. This is a clear example, in my opinion, in our opinion, that uh, the European solidarity in action, also in a rich town, in a rich urban area, such as, for example, Milan. As you can image clearly, as you can understand clearly, it wouldn't be possible without the financial support of the European cohesion policy. And uh, as you know better than me, the social problems, the social challenges, the social differences are increasing also in our urban areas, also in Milan. So I think that in the next programming period, we have to strengthen the urban dimension the metropolitan dimension of the European cohesion policy. And uh, here in Milan, uh, we have some ideas for working together. Thank you very much for your attention and greetings from Milan. Thank you very much, Mr. Pacenti, and ciao a tutti in Milano. Bye bye. Okay, moving on to another level, from the city to the regional, I would like to invite Marie-Antoinette Maupertuis and Elella, President of the Corsican Assembly of France. Please do share with us your experiences. Merci beaucoup. Alors, lorsque nous parlons de cohésion, bien évidemment, euh, ne pouvons nous empêcher de penser à nos amis euh, ukrainiens aujourd'hui, parce que la cohésion que nous défendons ici, c'est aussi la cohésion qui sera la leur euh, très prochainement, je l'espère. Alors, nous sommes des millions euh, d'Européens à vivre dans des régions avec des handicaps euh, géographiques et démographiques structurels et l'Europe doit être au plus près, et elle l'est déjà, de ces villes et régions insulaires, montagneuses, faiblement peuplées ou en transition. Et la politique de cohésion de l'Union est essentielle pour notre désenclavement. Et je vais donner un exemple très concret. Je ne vais pas parler de millions, je vais donner un exemple. Et c'est un petit voyage en Méditerranée que nous allons faire. La ville de Bastia, en Corse, est enclavée entre la mer et la montagne. Et la circulation est très difficile. Nous avons créé, grâce aux fonds structurels, aux fonds structurels deux infrastructures, à la fois de mobilité durable, de mixité sociale et d'ouverture sur l'espace européen et méditerranéen. Alors d'abord, le projet Aldi Londa, le long des flots, une passerelle éco-responsable de 480 mètres au-dessus de la mer qui relie les quartiers nord et les quartiers sud de la ville. Évidemment, c'est une promenade fantastique pour les populations qui relie les quartiers périphériques au centre-ville, à pied ou à vélo, qui relie les quartiers, qui enchante les touristes, un site exceptionnel. Cette passerelle via un ascenseur permet de monter dans la citadelle où vous découvrez un grand amphithéâtre, en plein air bien sûr, qui surplombe la Méditerranée, le port bien sûr et l'Italie qui est très proche, avec laquelle nous coopérons dans le cadre de la coopération territoriale européenne. C'est un lieu de culture 
qui accueille des artistes de toute la Méditerranée et qui fait vivre le vieux quartier de la Citadelle. Tout a été cofinancé par les fonds structurels et notamment par le FEDER. Donc je voulais témoigner ici, avec ces réalisations, que l'Europe investit pour créer plus de liens durables entre les quartiers, entre les villes, entre les régions européennes. Bastia et la Corse sont grâce aux fonds structurels au cœur de l'Europe et l'Europe au plus près d'une île montagne. Merci. So, Commissioner Ferreira and President Cordero still with us. Um, what I um, hear is that there is a sense of urgency in putting plans into action, that the cohesion funds shouldn't be turning into critical emergency funds in reality, that um, solidarity is being um, put into practice with the most vulnerable among us, that urban dimensions of the whole idea of cohesion should be strengthened and we were given a mind to travel experience showing that um, the funds literally forge ties on so many levels and in so many ways. Now is that also what you retain from what is being said or what is the um, call to arms that you remember? Well, I. Uh, first of all, I think it's, uh, it's very important that we share what we do and our experiences and what works and what doesn't work. Because uh, from all these people, from all these regions, from all these uh, cities, we have wonderful experiments, uh, things that are tried, uh, things that change the life of people and uh, change the potential for growth of these areas. Um, Two comments. One on uh, what uh, uh, dear Apostolos uh, mentioned um, about uh, this need to balance between short term and long term. We are all, and I am personally very much aware of this risk and of this challenge of having the new normal is that cohesion policy is the source of finance for all the emergencies. Having said this, for COVID, for uh, the welcoming that was amazing from European regions and citizens of the Ukrainian uh, friends that were fleeing the war, and uh, for the, some, of, some elements of the uh, increase in energy prices. If we had not done anything, and had been uh, freezing the funds for the long-term prospects, I think the situation across the different regions of Europe and different countries in a lot of situations would not have hold. What kind of values are we talking about? For, and uh, you know, CRI, the, I mean, the possibility to reprogram cohesion funds to address the needs due to COVID, so it was to support running costs in small companies, uh, jobs, uh, ventilators, uh, extra work for hospitals, everything that was of an emergency need. We have invested or reprogrammed 23 billion euros. Uh, but uh, the half of it was used by all the member states in the first six months. So this, this is, a, is quite significant because it was really emergency support. Uh, for the refugees, we reprogrammed again. And uh, we reprogrammed the, leg the legislative tax so that now we have 10 billion to support these people. Because I, I, oft I said it before and I want to repeat it, the hearts of people are immense. The pockets sometimes are not as big as the hearts. So there is this risk of having a refugee support fatigue uh, because people cannot hold this kind of effort for too long. Certain regions, particularly in the border areas, would have collapsed mm -hmm. under this, uh, this inflow. So we are talking about, uh, I mean, 10%, 11% of the overall funds. Uh, but 
we are very much aware that uh, we cannot uh, kind of be dispersed by this. And it is important to note the role that the Committee of the Regions and that the European Parliament, in particular, the Regi Committee and the, uh, the Chair, Mr. Omarji, is here, the support that we received from this plenary and from the Committee of the Regions, because, in fact, Committee of, uh, I mean, Committee of the Regions and Regi Committee of the European Parliament, because, in fact, there was unanimity or almost unanimity in all these movements, uh, because this was the sense of urgency. Yeah. And if we had not done it, uh, the regional problems or the imbalances would have broken Europe. We are conv convinced of this. Now, we have got a new period of support, 21-27, I close. Uh, we have signed the 22 partnership agreements. We'll sign this week the 23rd. So we are uh, we have approved the, the major, uh, not majority, but a high percentage of the operational programs. So let's move forward. Let's protect 2127. Let's go back to basics. But at the same time, uh, I think we did the right thing by doing what we did. And I'm, I, I, I always thank and I want to thank all of you for the support. But of course, it's important that also you tell people what you have done and what to, together we have done, because some people just don't know, citizens, that uh, this was support of the European U Union that kept a lot of the society and a lot of the economy alive with a bit of oxygen. So thank you once again. Thank you, Commissioner Ferreira. <laughs> President Cordeiro, what did you take away? Well, uh, I think one of the, if if I may say so, one of the lessons that uh, we can uh, take from the examples that were mentioned here is the richness of cohesion policy. The richness of situations where cohesion policy makes the difference and helps cities and regions across Europe to achieve this goal. And this leads me to another issue. It's very important that we do not fall in the trap of considering that cohesion policy is a policy just for some. Because everywhere, in every region, in every urban area, city, there are some kind of challenges that cohesion policy can help to address. So this is not a policy just directed or mainly directed for uh, the ones that are in a more fragile situation. This is a policy that touches, as I told before, the very core of the European project, and it's useful for everybody, for everybody. Third idea I would like to stress is the importance of involving cities and regions in the design of the way cohesion policy addresses those challenges. We will have during this week the presentation of the state, a report on the state of regions and cities across Europe. And it's interesting that, for example, in what concerns some of the instruments that were created to deal with the current situation, less than 1%, less than 1% of the respondents say they feel they were fully involved. Less than 10% say they were partially involved. This means we have a lot of work to do, not only at member state level, and it is important to stress that in first hand this is a responsibility of member states, but also from all European institutions to stress that the participation of the local and regional level is not only a question of the interest and responsibility of member states. No, it's a precondition to have an effective, efficient, well-delivered cohesion policy. You must involve local and regional levels, because if not, you won't have you won't have a cohesion policy that addresses the kind of situations that is intended to deal. So it's important that also at the European level, we stress that 
We have this policy, we have these resources, but in the way we deliver this policy, it's very, very important to involve local and regional authorities. And not only in the interest of local and regional authorities, but in the interest of the policy itself, in the way it can achieve its goals. Thank you. Thank you. This is only the beginning of the discussion. There's days ahead, but thank you for all that input. Um, and I want to uh, stress again that this event is not taking place only here. We are being watched by many, many, many people um, online um, and touching here upon some of the topics and angles that the cohesion policy and its impact on cities and regions provide. Um, but I'm curious to know what people out there um, via social media, the internet, Twitter, and so on, are uh, contributing, thinking, or commenting on watching what is happening here. And the one to turn to with that kind of questions is Alejandro. Alejandro, what can you tell us? Yes, Annelise, I'm here. So I'm here following not only the interventions from our panelists, but also the comments and participations from all of those you viewers and on-site and online participants. So before I give you the results on the first slide or question, let me share with you that the hashtag EU Regions Week has been mentioned already more than 500 times and still counting. And furthermore, our viewers on Twitter voted as Green Transition the most interesting topic of this year. That's also very positive. I want to thank you all for your amazing contributions and interactions, but still please stay engaged with us with the hashtag EU Regions Week. Now, going back to our first question on how, co how would you define cohesion policy in one sentence, the results show that for everyone who participated, cohesion policy reduces inequality in Europe. That is the most important and popular answer for now. I mean, not... Um, Continuing with the next ones, so that one followed by cohesion policy fosters territorial cooperation was the second most popular. And the third one, cohesion policy promotes solidarity across Europeans. But in the spirit of polling and, of course, uh, taking into account how important is cohesion in Europe, I invite once again all of viewers and everyone participating on Slido to answer the next question. The next question is, how is cohesion policy most supporting your city and region? The options are, it supports innovation, it supports climate action, it supports social inclusion, it supports young people, or it supports the digital agenda. Once again, you can do this through slido.com or the applications on mobile, tablet to computers, and you can use the code EU Regions Week. For the second question, then, I will give the results and my next intervention. So... Back to you, Annelise, for now. Thank you very much, Alejandro, and thank you out there all, to all of you for participating and taking part in this discussion. Now, in times of crisis and war, solidarity is not an empty word. Um, apart from generosity, it requires effort and courage and vision. You will hear in this next segment testimonials um, of what that means in practice with regard to the pandemic and to the war in Ukraine in particular. And as Alejandro said, keep feeding us with your ideas, with your questions, taking part in the Slido survey that is focused on this question of solidarity. And it has been mentioned by uh, the commissioner before that is to be forged bottom up. Now, bringing in new guests here on the podium, but also on the front row, I would like um, to address Vladislav Ortil, president of the Podkarpaki region in Poland, a member of the Committee of the Regions, to um, tell us about your experiences with um, solidarity, please. Panie Przewodniczący, Szanowna Pani Komisarz, dotychczasowe efekty polityki spójności są nie do przecenienia. Bez wątpienia polityka ta przyczyniła się do poprawy spójności gospodarczej, społecznej na terenie całej wspólnoty, w tym także oczywiście w moim kraju w Polsce. W województwie podkarpackim doceniamy także pomoc z inicjatywy REACTU, rozszerzającą dotychczasowy zakres środków. Beneficjenci, którzy realizowali projekty na 
naprawdę bardzo chętnie podjęli wezwania związane z pomocą uchodźcom. Wykazali się naprawdę dużą, potrzebną w tym momencie solidarnością. Oczywiście środki Unii Europejskiej, środki budżetu województwa, środki także budżetu państwa przeznaczyliśmy na pomoc uchodźcom w zakresie zapewnie na noclegu w organizacji zajęć, edukacji dla dzieci, także usług medycznych czy psychologicznych. Jesteśmy regionem granicznym, stąd potrzeby w tym zakresie są i były ogromne. Zarząd województwa przeznaczył też środki na tworzenie mieszkań dla uchodźców z Ukrainy. To jest takie działanie przyszłościowe. W czterech głównych mastach regionu takie mieszkania będą utworzone. Kolejnym ważnym projektem, który realizujemy z środków inicjatywy Reaktiu jest utworzenie Podkarpackiego Centrum Integracji dla Cudzoziemców. Obecnie mierzymy się oczywiście z dwoma problemami, żywiołami można powiedzieć, inflacją, problemami gospodarczymi, jak i oczywiście także z problemami związanymi z uchodźcą. Wojna trwa. Także ta przywoływana tutaj spójność i solidarność ma nową cenę i ma nowe, nowe wyzwania. Chciałbym się podzielić z Państwem moim apelem o zwiększenie puli dostępnych środków w ramach polityki spójności, szczególnie jeżeli chodzi o regiony peryferyjne, regiony słabiej rozwinięte czy graniczące z Ukrainą. Przypominam, że cele polityki spójności na lata 2021-2027 były formułowane w zupełnie innej rzeczywistości geopolitycznej, przed agresją Rosji Putinowskiej na Ukrainę. Chcę pokazać tylko jedną rzecz, która jest trochę trudna, bo, a ma konsekwencje daleko idące. Programy transgraniczne, które mamy w tej chwili, przykład tu jest programu Interreg Next Polska-Ukraina i kwota tego programu po wykluczeniu Rosji i Białorusi z tej pomocy transgranicznej o dziwo się zmniejszyła, a wyzwań przybyło. W czasie, kiedy był on składany, miliony uchodźców stały u granic wjazdu do Polski i innych krajów Europy i unoczniły nam, że na granicy Unii Europejskiej potrzeba nam więcej przejść granicznych, lepszej jakości tych przejść. Szanowni Państwo, podsumowując, chciałbym powiedzieć, że polityka spójności stanowi fundament rozwoju Unii Europejskiej, ale aby zwiększa jej moc oddziaływania, konieczna jest aktualizacja celów, dostosowanie wielkości pomocy do realnych potrzeb regionów, no i oczywiście uwzględniać musi agresję Rosji Putinowskiej na Ukrainę, problemy inflacyjne, gospodarcze, energetyczne i także oczywiście społeczne. Bardzo dziękuję. And on stage, um, in the meantime, you uh, can make the acquaintance of three young elected politicians who will also address you. And I would like to start with Karina Mikelsone, Deputy Mayor of Adagi, uh, Adagia in Latvia. Um, the floor is yours. Today we all participate in the war of Ukraine. Ukraine's with weapons, we with energy challenges. My municipality have tens of the less previous price. At the same time, in solidarity, we keep faith that we will achieve a common victory. Each of us helps in Ukraine as much as possible. Our municipality, solidarity, welcome Ukraine refugees, all in our inhabitant homes. Municipality of Adaji is strengthening cooperation with municipality of Slobozhansk in Ukraine. And tomorrow, we will sign a partnership memorandum. With this aim, not only classic cooperation, but also support with experience in preparing for admission in the European Union. After the war, It will be important for Ukrainians not only rebuild the destroyed infrastructure, but most and also to raise democracy to new level in its independent country. Today, from our friends in Ukraine, we feel they are already in process of transformation. It starts with a change of traditions in administration on municipal and next on state level. 
we Latvians know how hard and full of challenge is this path to democracy. We joined the European Union in 2004. Latvians know how important is support and understanding of partners when preparing for administration to European Union. We, others, Latvians, are ready to support Slobozhansk, Ukraine, in this process and share our experience. Thank you very much. Ms. Mikkelson. Moving on to Sofia Seduk, local councillor of Anderlecht here in Belgium, not far from here, in fact, and also member, as I said, of the Young Elected Politicians Programme. The floor is yours. Merci et merci beaucoup de, de nous accueillir en tant que jeune élu. Je crois que c'est aussi important d'entendre nos voix. Bah, les politiques de cohésion sociale permettent de, bah, justement, comme le disait le président du Comité européen des régions, de pouvoir traduire les concepts de solidarité en actions concrètes, que ce soit pour nos générations, mais aussi pour les générations futures. Et ces politiques bah, permettent aussi de prendre en compte ceux et celles qui sont actuellement et celles qui vont être plus touchées euh, par les effets des, euh, des crises et en particulier bah, la crise environnementale qui euh, nous touche en dehors de toutes celles qu'on qu on a déjà parlé euh, ce matin, cet euh, après-midi. Et quand je dis les personnes les plus vulnérables ou en tout cas les plus affectées, je pense justement aux personnes vulnérables et donc les jeunes. Et pour vous exemplifier, euh, en 2019, la Cour constitutionnelle fédérale allemande a statué que notre génération ne devrait pas être autorisée à consommer une grande partie du budget du CO2 sans réduire considérablement son empreinte, surtout si ça pousse les prochaines générations à ne plus avoir le choix que de réduire drastiquement leur propre consommation pour faire face au changement climatique. Et à ce sujet, euh, l'un des objectifs du Fonds européen de développement régional, donc le FEDER, euh, est de consacrer 30% de son budget à des mesures de soutien aux objectifs climatiques européens. Un deuxième objectif est de ne pas soutenir et de ne soutenir justement que les actions qui respectent le principe de non-nuisance. Aujourd'hui, Certains politiciens souhaiteraient redire l'ambition de l'Europe, l'ambition de rendre l'Europe climatiquement neutre d'ici 2050, en raison justement des différentes crises que nous connaissons actuellement. Et ce souhait, je pense réellement, se fait au détriment de tous et de toutes, de ma génération, mais aussi des futurs. Et ce ne serait pas un bon signal en termes de cohésion sociale et en termes de solidarité pour l'ensemble des, des Européens ce, ce message-là. Et donc, pour moi, il est vraiment important de pouvoir investir beaucoup plus, euh, davantage en tout cas, dans, le, dans la transition environnementale et sociale qui soit juste pour toutes et pour tous. Euh, et ça permettra ben, à nos enfants, à vos enfants, vos petits-enfants de profiter justement de la beauté de notre planète. Ouais. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. <applaudissements> Sophia Seduk. And now the floor uh, shifts to Kata Tuto, Deputy Mayor of Budapest in Hungary. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm not just here as a local leader, but as a woman. And I am ringing in this perspective of the upcoming winter in, in, in the energy crisis. So what I see, we were talking about energy poverty of households, and now we're talking about energy poverty of local municipalities and cities. And what I see as cities are considering to dim streetlights or cut streetlights, considering to have a longer winter break for nurseries, for schools, we see cutting public transport, we see closing or considering closing elderly daycare. How will this affect us? If I look at streetlight, women and men have a very, very different perception of safety when it comes to darkness. If cities will cut streetlights in the night, they will close in women. If I look at closing kindergartens and nurseries, we've seen that in the COVID pandemic, this will put a heavy burden on women's shoulder. If I look at public transport cutting, who are the main users of public transport? It's women. If I look at elderly daycare, how we see the most vulnerable population, it's mostly women. So what I see, if we don't change on how we think about our decisions, who will be affected, 
women will carry a much heavier burden this winter due to the energy crisis and due to our decisions. So I'm not turning to Elisa Ferreira, I'm turning to my fellow mayors and local decision makers to always have this perspective in mind when deciding. Thank you. Thank you very much. And last but not least for this section, Hugo Huet, welcome to you too. You're a local councillor of Asnier in France and also a member, as I mentioned, of the Young Elected Politicians Programme. What do you want to share with us? Madame la Présidente du Parlement européen, Monsieur le Président du Comité européen des régions, Madame la Commissaire, Mesdames et Messieurs les élus, chers collègues et amis, l'Europe se fera dans les crises et elle sera la somme des solutions qui leur seront apportées. Ces mots de Jean Monnet père fondateur de l'Europe, résonne aujourd'hui plus que jamais alors que notre Union fait face à des défis multiples. Le défi climatique d'abord représente probablement l'un des enjeux majeurs auxquels l'Union européenne devra faire face dans les prochaines années. Face à l'accélération du réchauffement climatique, face à la multiplication des catastrophes naturelles, la réponse individuelle des États n'est aujourd'hui plus suffisante. Ma génération réclame une action collective et rapide pour l'environnement. C'est l'objectif du Pacte vert qui ambitionne la neutralité carbone de l'Union d'ici 2050. L'action la plus récente dans ma région a d'ailleurs été l'achat, grâce à l'Europe, de plus de 300 nouveaux bus propres pour moderniser les mobilités. Le défi sanitaire, ensuite, auquel nous avons tous dû faire face ces deux dernières années, a montré l'importance de co-construire une réponse européenne de la santé, une réponse commune et solidaire qui s'est illustrée par des commandes mutualisées, par l'entraide hospitalière entre les régions ou encore dans ma région, par l'aide européenne à l'achat de 418 lits de réanimation. Enfin, évidemment, une attention particulière doit être portée sur les jeunes générations et c'est d'ailleurs l'enjeu de cette année 2022 dédiée à la jeunesse. Rien n'est possible, aucun défi n'est surmontable si l'Europe n'est pas capable d'assurer son avenir et sa cohésion. Il ne saurait y avoir d'Europe sans Européens. Pour que les jeunes aiment l'Europe, ils doivent apprendre son histoire, son fonctionnement, mais ils doivent aussi comprendre en quoi elle peut leur être utile. Très concrètement, c'est en partie grâce à l'Europe que nous avons pu fournir avec le Conseil régional d'Île-de-France un ordinateur à tous les lycéens. C'est aussi pour renforcer le sentiment d'appartenance à l'Europe que dans ma ville, à anières sur seine nous faisons découvrir aux jeunes les institutions européennes. L'Europe doit continuer à investir sur sa jeunesse. Pour conclure, je dirais que mon propos aujourd'hui est autant un témoignage qu'une invitation pour l'Europe à poursuivre son action avec nos institutions locales, nationales et européennes. Travaillons dès aujourd'hui pour bâtir ensemble une Europe prospère, ambitieuse et surtout tournée vers l'avenir. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup. So when I come back to you, uh, President uh, Vasco Alves Cordero and Commissioner uh, Elisa Ferreira, what I hear is that um, the youngest, I think, among us are um, passionately um, pointing out the importance of climate change and environmental policies, also in the context of the cohesion policy, combined with a social angle, of course. Um, we were... Um, uh, alerted to the fact that we shouldn't, or Europe, shouldn't lose the perspective of women um, um, out of sight, nor um, a young person's perspective, and um, bear it in mind. And I remember um, the express solidarity from Poland and Latvia, um, both countries with a um, special relationship, if I may say it's our history, rather, um, with our eastern neighbor. Um, and in that regard, um, closing or keeping uh, ties with Ukraine quite close in practical terms and with an eye on the future. But the question is, of course, what do you remember from what these people say and where do you feel, um, yes, we should take this to heart and um, do something with it? Yes, uh, I think, I think this, this kind of testimonies are essential because this is a, a cohesion policy in practice, in reality. In fact, I, I, on Ukrainian uh, refugees, uh, I was uh, absolutely, uh, I mean, moved and, uh, and uh, uh, it was very emotional and, uh, to see uh, what, uh, what uh, Polish people uh, and others across Europe are doing in relation to the, 
to this incredible effort to welcome refugees. I was in, in Chechov and we saw, I mean, and we met there. So uh, I was there, I saw it. And in fact, what we are doing now, and the, the European Parliament already voted fast care. Uh, the, the Council is going to vote it, I hope, very soon, uh, in a couple of days or just voted, I, I don't know, is exactly the agenda of the Council. But in fact, there is a reinforcement of the possibility to reprogram funds. Uh, in this proposal, 30% uh, of what is reprogramming f f reprogrammed, namely from cohesion fund, has got to be redirected to local entities, to actors, to NGOs, to municipalities, to people on the ground. And we are prolonging this possibility uh, that accompanies uh, doubling the period on which uh, refugee can be supported and increasing uh, the threshold from uh, 40 euros uh, to 100 euros uh, without uh, uh, invoices to support these people. So we are reinforcing this agenda, but it is also important that internally the member states organize themselves in a way to be able to redirect to the ones that really bear the cost. And often it is at the local and regional and, uh, and civil society level that the, the heaviest burden is, is felt. On, uh, on climate, I think, uh, I think it is important, and one of the speakers, I don't know uh, who mentioned it, if it was Sophia or Karina, but uh, there is, in fact, uh, the best way to combine uh, emergency with structural is, in fact, when we invest and we are asking for an investment of a minimum of 30% of the funds in climate and environment-related investments. So when I just came from Romania, I saw, I visited a hospital. This hospital, just by refitting the building that was a very old building, they estimate they are saving uh, and putting solar panels and uh, heat pumps. They are they saved immediately in their bill between 30 and 40 percent of their energy bill. So if we think that we can support this kind of actions in all the public buildings, in, in, uh, in, in uh, affordable housing, in uh, private houses, we can, and this is a win-win because we save. We don't have to import. Also, the effort to do renewables, we are insisting a lot on that, and we are doing a lot of that. So this is this kind of win-win. And of course, we are asking for make sure that you don't harm environment, but also that we don't harm cohesion when we invest. Mm -hmm. And see, so these are two basic lines. The third point I would like to address is uh, what, uh, what uh, uh, was mentioned about uh, our, our representative also from Poland saying, look what is happening when you do any measure. Make sure you understand who is suffering from it. You are very, very right to name women. But I would add to it, uh, look also at elderly people that are retired. Sometimes they are in rural areas. They don't have access, access to digital. They don't, I mean, look also at young people. They are suffering a lot. So we have got to, to look at the diversity of situations and be aware of them. Also, from a regional perspective, we saw examples from urban areas. And Vasco, was say, the president, was saying, OK, uh, we have got to adapt the policies so that we have a sense of proportionality, because we have areas, urban areas, that are using the funds for most intelligent things, artificial intelligence, uh, fantastic things, but we still have regions in Europe where you don't have running water and where you don't have sewage and children don't go to school. So we have got to adapt the policy in a proportionate way to the level of challenges that each sub-region in Europe is facing. 
and be sufficiently flexible, and we have got to have at the regional level sufficient capacity, technical and political, to prepare, to organize, and to use the funds in the way that we need them to be used. So diversity, recognizing diversity, adjusting to diversity, bottom-up uh, partnership, these are the ingredients that we want to keep uh, together with awareness of horizontal policies and of the RRP to the spatial impacts because no horizontal policy has the same impact across different regions. And this is you. the lessons I take also from you. Thank you. Thank you. President Cordero, would you like to add? Of course you can. <laughs> uh, first, I think this, those are more examples that stress the importance of cohesion funds to address the challenges that were mentioned here. Some of those challenges are emergencies, and I would like to stress one of the ideas that were, was already uh, mentioned here before, that um, we cannot, we must be care very careful because the risk is... <coughs> to consider that cohesion policy is the money pot where you can have money at hand to address those emergencies first and secondly to address them in some cases that in a way that is not um, structural. Uh, for example, about the energy prices the temptation is high to use funds to address this challenge. But we must stress the importance, at least from my point of view, to have a structured approach that favors more energy transition, favors more creating the conditions that after this emergency we have a completely different landscape, more prepared to face other emergencies than the one we have today. Third, stressing the importance of cohesion policy starts not with the European institutions starts with, with us, local and regional authorities. And I think there is a good margin of progression or of improvement for promoting cohesion policy in each one of our communities. To say it in another way, to make citizens the main defenders of cohesion policy. Because when citizens are aware that in health, in qualification, in accessibilities, in, in, in so many areas, the difference or the improvements in their condition comes not from other source than European funds or European decisions, they will become, alongside with the institutions, the local and regional authorities, they will become one of the main defenders of cohesion policy. And in this specific area, I am convinced that we all, local and regional authorities, have a big margin of improving and promoting uh, cohesion policy. Thank you, Mr. Cordero, for a... Um ambitious goal set out there, something to be discussed among you uh, in the following days. Thank you very much. I want to bring in you again, Alejandro, because um, do you have an update for us on what's going on on social media? Of course, Annelise, I can tell you that we have more than 800 mentions, 300 more than the previous intervention, and that's using the hashtag EU Regions Week. And for the second question on how is cohesion policy most supporting your city and region, the most popular answer is it supports social inclusion. Now, for a one last time, one last question. So, 
this is the one that maybe could be more open for everyone, which is if there is one thing we could improve about cohesion policy in the future, what would it be? So once again, on Slido.com, applications on your socials, uh, sorry, application on your mobile phone, the tablet or your computer, and using the code EU Regions Week. For now, that's everything I got. And let me ask you, isn't this an incredible opening of the Week of Regions and CCs in its 20th anniversary? Yes, Alejandro, for sure, this uh, kickoff um, meeting of minds provides uh, the participants with lots of food for thought in the next couple of days. So far, we've been looking back on what the EU's cohesion policy made possible to begin with. We've discussed what difference it makes here and now in practice at a time uh, of crisis, of war as well. In this next third, last session, we'll address the future and think about what cohesion policy might or should mean. Unity in diversity is a very noble goal, but how does one put it into practice? The eighth cohesion report, it has been mentioned uh, before, gives an overview of the variety of differences that um, exist between regions and cities on many, many different levels. It highlights the challenges embedded in the idea of cohesion in and of the EU at large. The final version of the report came out, however, before, just before the beginning of the war in Ukraine, which of course added extra dimensions, extra fissures also to the mix since. So the question arises, where do we go from here? What does cohesion mean after 2027? How can it be reinforced across all EU policies? What are the pitfalls? What are the possible conflict zones, opportunities and priorities? How does it take shape more efficiently and more effectively? Of course, those are questions that will be hotly debated and shaped among you in the next couple of days of this week. But to kick off that debate here and now, we will hear from a couple of key players. And the first I'd like to invite to share his ideas on this is Yunus Omarji, um, Chair of the Committee of Regional Development um, at the European Parliament. Welcome to you and the floor is yours, Mr. Omarji. Merci beaucoup. Dans, dans la suite de la Présidente Roberta Metzola, Je veux souhaiter la bienvenue à tous les membres du comité des régions, saluer la commissaire Elisa Ferreira et souligner l'excellente coopération qui existe entre le comité des régions, Cotère et la commission Régie. Et nous sommes mobilisés évidemment vers les mêmes objectifs. Et je crois que cette unité entre les institutions européennes Conseil européen également, Commission européenne et Parlement européen, en ces temps de crise, est extrêmement précieux. Deuxièmement, je veux rappeler que la politique de cohésion est une politique née par la solidarité des États membres et pour la solidarité. Et en ces temps de crise, et en particulier pendant 
la pandémie du Covid et aujourd'hui pendant la guerre d'Ukraine, nous comprenons très bien que l'Europe peut mourir par manque de solidarité et par déficit de cohésion. Et plus que jamais donc, nous avons besoin d'une politique de cohésion forte. Et plus que jamais, nous avons conscience que la politique de cohésion est une grande politique très réactive face aux crises. Personne ici, je crois, ne remettra en cause ce que nous avons accompli pendant la pandémie du Covid. Et bien sûr, je comprends cette dichotomie entre réponse d'urgence et politique de long terme. Parce qu'il est vrai que notre politique est une grande politique de long terme. Mais comprenez qu'il n'est pas possible de maintenir les grands objectifs d'une politique de long terme si nous ne réglons pas les questions d'urgence et si nous ne sommes pas au rendez-vous des crises qui se présentent devant nous. Et nous l'avons été pendant la crise du Covid et nous le sommes aujourd'hui pendant la guerre d'Ukraine. La guerre d'Ukraine, c'est d'abord l'un des plus grands mouvements de population depuis la Seconde Guerre mondiale. Et il était de la responsabilité de l'Union européenne et de notre politique de cohésion de venir en aide à la fois aux réfugiés ukrainiens, mais aussi aux régions et aux villes qui avaient à assumer l'accueil de ces réfugiés. Et puis aujourd'hui, ce sont bien sûr des impacts multiples qui sont tout à fait vertigineux et qui euh, s'abattent euh, dans un temps euh, extrêmement euh, rapide. Et là aussi, je crois que le bon dialogue entre la Commission euh, européenne et la Commission euh, régie euh, permettra euh, dans euh, les semaines euh, à venir un certain nombre de réponses pour venir en aide aux familles les plus vulnérables, mais aussi et surtout aux collectivités, régions et communes qui ont des difficultés pour payer leurs factures énergétiques et puis surtout venir en aide aux petites entreprises qui sont dans un moment de très grande fragilité, de très grande insécurité et si nous ne prenons pas des mesures immédiates pour les petites entreprises, alors il y aura une épidémie de fermeture d'entreprises et une aggravation du chômage. Dans ce contexte-là, nous gardons des objectifs de long terme. Et je veux évoquer une question très importante pour la Commission Régie qui n'a pas été évoquée concernant le futur de la politique de cohésion. C'est la question des catastrophes naturelles. Ces catastrophes naturelles aujourd'hui sont devenues une donne permanente elles sont un facteur de déstabilisation de toute la politique régionale et nous devons nous engager beaucoup plus encore pour une véritable euh, stratégie européenne d'adaptation au réchauffement climatique avec les moyens donnés aux régions, aux communes pour pouvoir penser le futur euh, autrement. Merci beaucoup. Merci à vous, Monsieur Omar. Emil Bock, I would like to invite you to address the audience. You're chair of the Cotter Commission, European Committee of the Regions, and mayor of Cluj-Napoca, am I pronouncing that correctly? Well, very well. In Romania. So, please. Dear Commissioner, dear Presidents, um, bonjour à toutes et à tous. I will, I will start putting it this way. The future of cohesion policy is the future of the European Union. And... Uh, From my perspective, the cost of no cohesion is the cost of no Europe. As Commissioner um, Ferreira said, the single market cannot alone assure a balanced development of Europe. We need cohesion policy to make a balanced Europe, a balanced development, and to be sure that we have a win-win situation in every corner of the European Union. So if we are going to talk about the future of Europe, definitely we have to talk about the future of the cohesion policy. 
The second element would be that the cohesion policy is not a technicality. It's a very political principle of our treaties and of our union, because we cannot assure the implementation of the principles from the, from the treaties of the European Union if we do not emphasize the importance of the cohesion policy. The third element, we have to avoid in the future the fragmentation of the cohesion policy. It's a must from my perspective in order to achieve the real aim of the cohesion policy is one of the oldest policies of the European Union and it's making the difference in every corner of our Europe. We have been discussing with Commissioner Ferreira in the morning and she mentioned, look, for Latin America, for example, and make the difference in Europe. The cohesion, Europe, the cohesion policy is one of the differences which is making uh, the difference in our, in our world. So we have to keep our cohesion policy if we want to keep a very competitive Europe and with a quality of life in every corner of the European Union. The fourth element is that in the very moment we are a little bit late with 2021-2027. So we are eager to work together for simplification and flexibility in order to make the difference on the ground on the implementation of the European funds. Because our citizens need to see concrete results on the ground. So if we are going to move faster, definitely we are going to be uh, winners. And together with President Omarget and uh, President Cordiero and uh, with the European Commission, we are going to work together as a quarter, as the European Committee of the Regions, to have the most successful cohesion policy in Europe for the future and, the future, and for the future of Europe. Thank you. Thank you. And next up is Radim Schren, if, uh, Mayor of the Municipality of Dolny Sudenki and Deputy Minister of Regional Development in the Czech Republic. The floor is yours. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure for me to represent this honorable forum, Rural Areas, as a proud citizen of Rural Areas, as a proud Mayor of Rural Areas. And we all know that Europe starts in Rural Areas because uh, we Everywhere we go to Europe, we come through rural areas. We also know that the eighth cohesion report shows that the rural areas are left behind. And we all know that uh, those crises we have been facing made rural areas even more vulnerable. But on the other hand, uh, I believe that every, every crisis brings opportunity. And now I feel that we have a great opportunity for the transformation of rural areas and the rural revival. But uh, we need what we need to do uh, for that. First of all, we need a new uh, kind of approach to the rural development policies because uh, uh, the rural areas uh, need to be approached across all the funds, all the policies, all the instruments we do have. Secondly, uh, we do need to make the rural development as a part of a regional development interconnected to urban development. I'm sure that we need much more to foster the rural urban linkages. S thirdly, we need much more to use integrated place-based approach because we have data, we have evidence-based policies, we can tailor-make solution for each and every area in Europe and we should use also innovative instruments like community-led local development, rule proofing or uh, smart villages for example. So to sum it up, uh, if we really want to use this opportunity for rural transformation and rural revival, we must uh, use those instruments and then I think our dream and our visions we have on the European level uh, will come true and uh, we can move uh, the rural areas by 20 years. Thank you. Thank you. And again, last but not least, a uh, young elected uh, politician, uh, Ilaria Capano. Welcome to you, member of the City Council of Scandici in Italy. What do you want to share with us? Well, thank you. As a young elected politician, I believe that our cohesion policies should now more than ever, especially after the pandemic, prioritize digital innovation. Some progress has been made, however, not enough across all European regions. There remain issues like guaranteeing equal access to internet, updating worker skills and digitalization of businesses. Therefore, it is essential to develop for better digital infrastructure, for increased connectivity between people, workers and businesses, leading to smarter regions. 
we must continue to invest in high-speed networks and 5G coverage across Europe because greater connectivity is a necessary condition to create smarter cities and improving our lives in education at all levels from primary school to university, at work, for private users and businesses, making it easier to adhere to bureaucracy. <laughs> and let me add, if I may, as president of the Equal Gender Commission in my council, and as a young woman, uh, that a successful cohesion policy should also lead to a more cohesive society at the micro level. European Union funds should push for a greater gender equality and guaranteeing equal pay for women, not only between women and men who undertake the same tasks, skills and studies, but also between women from different European regions. And transparency is the most efficient tool to tackle the gender pay gap. Um, I think like investing, investment or incentive for promoting the reskilling of women for new jobs or promoting the right to work remotely for new parents. Because, and I conclude, uh, two years of COVID have confirmed that uh, digital access in our <laughs> interconnected world is fundamentally important. And we, young Europeans, cannot be unprepared for this challenge. Thank you very much, you. Ilaria Capano. <laughs> so a lot of... Um, Talking points again, uh, natural catastrophes should be taking into account the uh, importance of cohesion, the urban-rural divide should be um, diminished, um, and also a gender um, equality should be top of mind, as well as the digital uh, transition um, should be speeded up, is what I understand is being said here, among many other things. Alejandro, how are you up there? Um, by now, I think you must have the answers to your Slido survey on the future of the cohesion policy. Am I right? That's right, Annalise. And sadly, now we have come to an end. But not before I give you the results of our last question. If there is one thing we could improve about cohesion policy in the future, what would it be? The most popular, is, the mo most popular answer is simplification. Now, before I say goodbye, I just want to say thank you to everyone who was involved in the preparation of the Week of Regions and Cities, to you, our participants, to our guests, to everyone in here. And I wish you all a wonderful day. This is bye for me and Annalise. What a pleasure working with you. Till next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Alejandro. Thank you very much. And um, me too. I liked working together. We've come to the end, almost the end. Don't go anywhere yet, just yet. Hold on. Um, as I said, much food for thought has been provided, has been shared. Many questions have been raised. Lots of angles for discussions have been offered here um, for the next couple of days. To round off this session, however, I would like to invite the distinguished high-level guests here on the podium, still with us, thank you for that, um, to share your final remarks on what has been said here. And also, before anything else, I want to thank everyone who has spoken today for sticking to the timetable. You've made my work very easy, so thank you for that. But final word, um, let me start with you, uh, Yunus Omarji. What do you think is of the essence of what has been said so far? Tout d'abord, je veux vous dire que je suis très impressionné par cette plénière du Parlement européen et du Comité des Régions, totalement tournée, mobilisée pour la politique de cohésion, pour sa défense et pour sa promotion. Et nous avons devant nous une bataille, la bataille que nous menons tous ici ensemble, qui concerne le devenir de la politique de cohésion et son futur. Et chacune et chacun d'entre vous est des ambassadeurs pour militer partout dans vos régions, partout dans vos États membres,
partout dans les institutions européennes pour que nous maintenions une politique de cohésion grande et une politique de cohésion forte. Parce que tous les débats ont montré que plus que jamais, nous avons besoin d'une grande politique de cohésion pour d'abord continuer à réduire les fractures territoriales à l'échelle de l'Union européenne. Parce que notre politique de cohésion, elle concrétise la réalisation de la promesse de l'Union européenne. Elle concrétise la réalisation de la promesse de l'adhésion à l'Union européenne. Donc, continuer à réduire les fractures territoriales et puis, bien sûr, pouvoir projeter l'ensemble des régions d'Europe, l'ensemble des communes d'Europe vers les nouveaux défis qui nous attendent, la digitalisation de l'économie, on en a parlé, l'Europe beaucoup plus verte, tournée vers les objectifs climatiques, bref, une Europe tournée vers les défis du XXIe siècle. Et nous avons besoin d'un lobby, et ce lobby, il est devant nous, il est celui de l'Alliance pour la cohésion, promu par le comité des régions et je crois comité des régions, commission européenne, parlement européen, nous aurons une programmation au-delà de 2027 qui, je l'espère, sera ambitieuse. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Commissioner Elisa Ferreira, your final words on this, please. Well, first of all, uh, thank you to everybody that is so engaged. And, uh, and I think this was a very important and very, um, very useful session of work because we understand that we are really all united for a certain objective, and this objective is solidarity and cohesion. Um, secondly, maybe some figures, I don't like to quote figures, but maybe some figures will help you to have a broad, aggregated view of, uh, for instance, what the uh, period of cohesion that is now finishing is delivering. With 2014-2020, uh, 1.4 million small companies were supported. It can be in capital, in special loans, in assistance. This uh, means that uh, more than 230,000 uh, jobs were created uh, in those enterprises. Uh, when we talked about climate, this support has, together with the national counterpart, uh, create, reduced the equivalent to 4.4 million tons of CO2. So this is quite significant. And uh, answering Hilaria, 5.5 uh, uh, million additional households were able to have broadband. Uh, and uh, 22 million people benefited from in improved health services. So this gives you a dimension of what we are doing. But I don't like these broad figures because they have to materialize in the right and adequate policies at the level of each region, at the level of, this, of each municipality. And this is the secret of the whole thing, is to adapt, to come from the general view into the place-based, adapting to the realities. I'm very, very happy to see so many young politicians in charge because we need their energy, we need their vision. Uh, I mean, our generation has done what we could, some things we did right, some things we did wrong, but now it's up to them to bring forward. And of course, you've got to look very carefully at the situation of young people, at the situation of women, at the situation of elderly, and at the situation of children, because children went through a very traumatic period. Some of them were dropped into poverty, and when you have a poverty situation as a child, it will affect you throughout your whole life. 
So this is also to be taken care of, and also in the sense of proportionality between the role of cities, the role of rural areas, the role of peripheral areas, the role of islands, the role of ultra-peripheral areas, so regions in transition, in industrial or other transition, and each requires a mix of policies uh, that need to be developed through the technical and political capacity and knowledge of, of the leaders. But because we are aware of these difficulties and of the, the margin for improvement, uh, we are starting from uh, the Commission and DG Regio in particular, uh, open discussion of how we can improve regional policy. We are starting this, we'll have a kind of a think tank, a very small think tank, but uh, there will be moments to listen to all of you and to get uh, much more than this, and I thank you for this, this uh, overall impressions, okay, we need simplification. What exactly does that, that mean? Where, where are the bottlenecks? We need more efficient uh, policy. How to do it? So uh, we are opening this discussion in the follow-up of the Eighth Cohesion Report and bearing in mind everything that we have been discussing here. We hope to be able to develop this work, this reflection, throughout 2023, to have, by the end of 2023, a kind of summing up uh, to be offered to all of us so that we can we can make make the best of taxpayers' money dedicated to this European glue that keeps us together and going. So thank you very much once again. Thank you. And last final word is for you, um, President Cordero, but what I hear from the Commissioner is uh, reaching out to all of you, working together for better even better policies. You must be happy to hear that, I imagine. Yes, yes, very <laughs> happy. Uh, but in my final remarks, I would like to start by thanking the speakers and thanking everybody that make, made this session possible and makes this week possible. It's uh, from the European Commission, from the Committee of the Regions, and of course, from the European, uh, European Parliament. The second message I would like is in a very, maybe in a very specific way, but I think it's very, very important. Commissioner Ferreira introduced uh, do no harm to cohesion principle. I think this needs to start being implemented now. So it's, it's very simple, this territorial approach to a lot of uh, European policy should be something that needs to be uh, implemented, needs to be considered right now. Third, uh, about the future and some of the ideas that uh, Commissioner Ferreira left and some of the ideas that uh, we are working. Um, we, the Committee of the Regions is, and I think Commissioner Ferreira knows that very, very well, we are eager and interested in being part in all the efforts that can lead to uh, discussion and a debate about the future of cohesion policy. But the future of cohesion policy starts now. And I think it's very, very important to be aware that this debate and this discussion is already uh, in place, is already taking place. On Wednesday, I will have the opportunity as President of the Committee of the Regions to announce the launching of uh, a new cohesion alliance for new challenges that specifically wants to address the importance of this moment and the importance, uh, importance of raising the awareness of mobilizing um, uh, wills, mobilizing uh, protagonists for this fight in favor of cohesion policy. Um, but I think we should be all aware that we cannot take the, ris the risk of preaching to the converted. It's very important, very important that this discussion goes out of the Committee of the Region, goes out of the European Parliament, goes out of the uh, European Commission, because as we've seen today, 
I don't think the need to convince anyone of the importance of the cohesion policy lies here in the session or in the organizations that make part of the session. The need to convince others of the importance of the cohesion policy lies, for example, in national governments, um, in the public that needs to see that speaking of cohesion policy is speaking about Europe itself. But I think we will succeed. I think everybody here is mobilized and eager to convince the ones that are not still convinced that cohesion policy equals this European dream, equals this European ambition. It's the way to achieve it. And it's not a question of conviction, of believing. It's a question of looking to proofs, looking at evidence, looking of what European cohesion policy has already been able to achieve, and thinking of how much more it can achieve considering the current challenges we are facing. I have, and I would like to conclude with this word of confidence, of uh, profound conviction that we are in the right track of history, in the right track of fulfilling our founding father's dream about a Europe that is built and unite in diversity. And the way to do that is through cohesion policy. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I would like to thank indeed uh, Reggie Chair Yunus Amarji, Commissioner Elisa Ferreira and Core President Vasco Cordeiro. Thank you very much for helping starting this discussion for the next few days because yes, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of what's happening here, this plenary session in the European Parliament for here and now. But as I said, it's only the beginning really for all of you um, for the discussions and the debates during the EU Regents Week. From me, I can only say that I wish you fruitful discussions and exchanges Thank you for being here, joining in, and goodbye.